Well, happy Valentine's Day. My wife reminded me this morning that uh, this is the second year in a row I've been out of town, so you probably won't see me here next year, otherwise I'll be in big trouble. Well, this morning we're going to talk about vine selection and a little bit more about establishment. So there's a lot of factors that you need to consider. Uh, we've covered some of these already. Um, Again, what I'm going to focus on today is uh, plant material selection, so what kind of plants, the quality of those plants, and again, the quality of the plants are really, really important, uh, I think, for the early establishment of a vineyard, and uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, some of it's due to the plant, sometimes it's due to what happens once that plant is put in the ground, and so we're also going to cover a little bit about planting and how important that operation is. It seems so simple, but... Again, a lot of things can go wrong. And then I'm also spent, spent a little bit of time about talking about training and, and pruning of young plants. And again, I've done quite a bit of experimental work looking at how you can promote some of that, again, with the hope that you get better plant establishment or development and earlier plant production. So let's start with plant material selection. Again, there's a lot of ways you can, or a lot of types of uh, planting stock that you could use. Uh, you know, years ago when we weren't so concerned about soil pests, phylloxera or, or nematodes, uh, we could use cuttings. Uh, it's not used very much anymore, but uh, it was very simple. Andy alluded to that a little bit. All you had to do is stick a couple of sticks in the ground, or better yet, if you uh, put them and warmed them up and got a little bit of a root initials prior to planting, that was a very common way years ago of, of putting vines if you want to own rooted plants. Uh, and a little bit of an improvement on that is using uh, dormant rootings of, of uh, vinifera plants. But again, that's risky in, in most of the coastal areas due to phylloxera. And, and it's getting a little more risky, I think, in, uh, as we reestablish vineyards in the same sites and we have other pests uh, such as nematodes. Again, we kind of moved now to a lot of these areas to the need for uh, some kind of resistant rootstock for some of these soil pest uh, uh, issues. So again, uh, the use of a rootstock, again, you can use a dormant rootstock rooting. So that's a, a rooted, you know, a cutting that uh, now is typically they're field grown. And, and so you would plant that and then graft that on site. Uh, that's, that's still used. Uh, but probably more commonly now is the use of bench grafts. So again, that's some type of rootstock with whatever fruiting cultivar you're, you're going to use. And again, uh, dormant bench grafts are probably still m the more common. But again, we see again uh, more use of these green growing bench grafts. So the difference here, the dormant bench graft typically is grafted. It's grown in a greenhouse. It's put out in a field where it's grown for a season and then it's planted the following season. The greens are, are grafted, grown in a greenhouse. They're conditioned out in, the, out in the shade house for a while to harden that tissue up, and then they're planted in the same year that the graft's made. They can work very well in some areas, but again, maybe weaker sites, or especially sites that have wind, uh, a, or severe wind, like we do see in some of the coastal valleys. Those plant materials sometimes will struggle if they're not handled properly. And then the new one I'll touch a little bit on is the, the use of these tall, what I call tall bench grafts. It's a long, it's essentially a bench graft. It, it's a long piece of rootstock. And so again, uh, there's some, some different uh, things you can accomplish with those that uh, we'll talk about. There are standards for what, a, when you're talking about a dormant bench graft, there are standards and what we call a number one. So these are the standards that uh, have been reported or, or, or established. And if you look at some of these, it's, it's, it's not a real high benchmark to, to achieve a number one. But oftentimes, if you're really pushed for plant materials, sometimes the nurseries will tell you, well, I don't have enough number ones, but I have some twos or threes. And sometimes those aren't the best plants to be using. Uh, so, but you kind of have to give them the visual look. And so again, uh, you know, there's caliper requirements, uh, uh, number of top growth is important. I mean, you'd like to get bench grafts or planting material that you know has grown fairly well the year before. 
Uh, it, it has very good root development. Uh, I'd like to see more than three roots on a plant if I was going to put that out of field, but that is the, the minimum requirement. And again, I think it's really important to look at those graft unions as you get plant material and make sure that union is, is solidly formed. If you get plants and you can't put a little bit of thumb pressure, those plants sometimes will have uh, problems down the road. And again, uh, they should always be free from physical damage. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about free from disease. That again is very critical. If we have enough problems, we don't need to bring more problems in with, with the plant material. Whether that is some kind of disease or some kind of physical damage that's going to impair the development of that plant. So again, here's uh, two examples. So here's our dormant bench graph. This is actually a pretty nice dormant bench graph. You can tell by the size or caliper of the spur here that this actually probably grew relatively well. It has a very nice graph union. So this is the, the fruiting cultivar on top. This is the bench graph, or the, excuse me, the rootstock. And you see some nice root development that's kind of radially uh, uh, spaced around the base of that plant. This is a green plant. This is actually an old one that was, when we first started using these, probably in the early 90s, uh, or maybe late 80s. Um, they were typically put in these small pots. You'll see them in much larger pots. But again, these were grown in a greenhouse, hardened off, go directly out in the field. We had some real severe problems with these when people started using those, uh, especially after the, some of the phylloxera problems we had in the mid to late 80s. And again, uh, the common problems were these, these plants weren't hardened off enough prior to delivery, and so you would see a lot of stress. And so stress, especially in these windy areas, we would see a lot of uh, uh, collapse of this very tender tissue that was you know, greenhouse grown. If you don't have it... Uh, outside to harden up, uh, uh, up enough, uh, you, you get a lot of stunting and, and dieback of some of those shoots. Uh, the other problem was, again, the, depending on the type of pots and how long it was in the pot, there's always a lot of potential for uh, those things to get root bound. So essentially, here's kind of the, uh, the potential options that uh, nurseries can deliver to you. So kind of the standard. Uh, Dormant bench graft. These are a tall plant that's field grown. These are tall plants that have been grown in a pot. And so you can get these green. Again, same like the others. It's, it, the year it delivered is the year it was propagated. Or you can get them dormant. So again, they let, let those plants, typically in the nursery, in this case, uh, uh, you know, go dormant. And then they'll, they, they deliver these as a, as a dormant pot or a dormant plant. These, again, would be delivered in the, the year, second year after being propagated. Of course, the other option we, I mentioned earlier was the use of just a rootstock rooting. And, and oftentimes, you get very good development because that plant actually grows sometimes or that root system develops better under a, a, a non-grafted plant because it generally develops a much larger canopy. So again, you can kind of equate how much that plant's growing to how much root development you have underground. And so we generally get very good establishment of, of using uh, rootstock rootings, but then they need to be field grafted. And so that, again, enters a little bit of a risk because grafting is very dependent on the skill of the grafter and also the weather conditions at the time that graft is made. And sometimes you don't get uh, very, you know, or if you get low takes, again, that takes multiple passes through the field to get you back up to 100%. But when you get good takes, you get actually very good development, uh, and it still is, is an option. Again, uh, this disease uh, issue is, is very critical. Again, we, we always recommend the use of certified plants. And what does that mean? It means they've been tested for certain virus diseases. So when you buy a California certified plant, there's a list of viruses that those plants were initially tested for uh, to, to be free from. Obviously, we've had issues with things like red blots that were not known. And so there was a lot of what was so-called certified plants that had red blots that went out. 
So we're dealing with those issues now. The other question is, they're, they're, the plants are cleaned up, certified at FPS, Foundation Plant Services. That material is sent to a nursery where they propagate it. There's always a concern in the, in the nursery fields how to keep all that material clean. And so again, sometimes things were clean, but they go off site, they pick up viruses, and then they're, they're still sold. And so it's still the cleanest material, but sometimes certified doesn't always mean it's all clean. Or there's new viruses that we've found, such as the red blotch. The other thing to always remember is you've got two, in a, in a, in a bench graph, you've got two components there. Both the rootstock and the cyan have to be clean. And so we've seen people have clean cyan material, the vault variety or cultivar, but they used infected rootstock. And so down the road, they've popped up uh, with some virus issues, and that was because that both those components weren't clean. Again, the site preparation is uh, very important. Again, a lot of this is to re reduce some of the physical issues that might exist in a vineyard soil, especially when it comes to, to hardness or, or compaction in the soil that may potentially re uh, impact root growth, or oftentimes it's also impacting water movement through that soil. And so again, grapevines can tolerate a lot of moisture in the soil when they're dormant. As soon as they start growing, water is not going to be your friend if that soil is saturated. And so again, we see a lot of issues, you know, post-planting with uh, very saturated soils. Again, proper storage and handling is very critical. So typically, if you're using dormant material, that material is stored, typically in, in a cool storage shed. And again, it has to be maintained at a right temperature, not too cold, so you get freezing damage in storage, or not too hot also. The other thing, it has to maintain uh, moisture so you don't get drying out. And so again, it's very critical when you get plant material that you either visit the nursery and always look at your plants in the field, in storage, and then when you get those, to really check those to make sure that they're, they're uh, not dried out, there's, there's no uh, evidence of uh, freeze damage. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is when you get them delivered, and especially if it's dormant material, it's best to wait and let that material warm up a little bit and actually get active, almost to the point where you see a little bit of bud swell. And so when you plant that material, it's ready to go. It's not sitting out in the sun and cold where it has the potential of drying out prior to growing. Again, uh, very critical is to avoid planting issues. And so Andy showed some pictures. I'll show you some more pictures of what sometimes can go wrong in a vineyard if those plants aren't placed properly. And again, uh, this irrigation management is very critical. And oftentimes, people over-irrigate new vineyards or under-irrigate them sometimes. And again, that can impart some stress and develop uh, a number of different, different issues in the vineyard. So here you see an example of uh, a physical dam damage on these plants. So this was a, a nursery delivered some plants, and uh, a great percent of the plants had this wound on the side. Some of them had a wound on both sides. And so we, we think that what happened here is in, in the nursery row, they were probably running something like a bezariti or some kind of weed knife and whacked these plants. You'd rather not see that in a plant. What was interesting is when you cut these, you see a little wedge-shaped canker. That turned out to be bot canker. And so again, that was something you would not want to plant these kind of plants. We already have enough issues and see declines with uh, these canker diseases in the vineyard as they get older, you don't want to plant something with those kind of issues. So again, inspecting those plants, are they up to your standards prior to sticking them in the ground? Uh, the other thing is, there's a lot, the process of propagating plants, there's a lot of cuts. There was a little bit of mention uh, the other day about uh, these fungal, uh, fungal, uh, they, they're not really, they're, they can be endophytic, so they're, they're living in that wood. They can be pathogens, but sometimes they're a certain percent exist, and there can be no problems, at least in the early life of the vineyard. And so sometimes you make these cuts. Uh, you have to decide sometimes, is that a cut where that tissue is died back a little bit, or is this, or this brown area, is that from natural dieback at the end, or is that potentially a, some kind of fungal organism? And so we do know that a lot of, uh, especially these vine decline organisms, are in the wood. 
If it's in the wood when it goes within the nursery, it comes out of the nursery at a much higher percentage. And if it goes in the field, sometimes there's no issue, but if there's some kind of stress that sets that, that, that f fungus off, it can become a problem. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and I'll show you some examples. So planting, sounds pretty simple, dig a hole, put it in the ground, well, what can go wrong? A lot. So once you get them in the ground, everything looks great. As long as they're, there's a, a bench graft that's been planted, and looks, everything looks great, it's good to go. But do you know how that root is distributed within that planting hole? It's very critical that there's not any J-rooting or bunching up of that root system, or also what was the quality of that hole when it was, what the quality of the soil, was it too wet, was it, well, did you slick that hole? And so those are all things you really have to really pay attention to. And so there's a lot of ways of planting vines. Uh, you can dig holes with, with a shovel, you can dig them with a, a post hole digger. Uh, here's uh, the use of an auger. Uh, here's a mechanical pruner. And they can all be done, be done relatively effectively. I mean, people are looking at ways to, to uh, reduce labor costs. Uh, obviously, at the time of planting, especially if it's a high, high density planting, that, that labor cost it can be fairly high. And so these type of machines can do a pretty nice job. This is actually a pretty nice machine. This is a Clemens planter. It actually is GPS guided. So that operator just kind of puts that thing in gear and goes. And this, this tractor and the placement of the plants is all uh, guided by a GPS system. So very precise planting. You can, you can adjust the depth and it, it can do a very nice job. Again, the soil type and, and, and preparation is critical so you get nice development. There's other machines that uh, do similar type things. Uh, sometimes you'll see hash marks or some of them are GPS guided also. Uh, but people are hand plant, plant, placing uh, the, the plants in a, in, a, in a series of shells. It opens up the soil, they put in a plant, and it closes up. You can get the same things of too deep a placement, and you can get jade reading with those also. The other thing, again, what is the quality of that soil, or what's the tilt of that soil at the time of planting? Well, especially if you're using augers, but the same thing can happen with the shovels too. If that soil's too wet, you can get a lot of slicking of that hole. Again, that gives you a kind of a, a pot effect where those roots aren't going to distribute very well within that soil if there's some kind of glazing in that hole. So again, all those factors should be considered and managed properly. So here you see a plant uh, in the ground. Everything looks great. But where's the graft union? The graft union has been buried. So Here's the surface, the grafting is here down several inches. And especially for, uh, for grafted plants, plants don't like to grow on those rootstocks. If they have the ability, they're, they're going to create their own roots and grow, and you're going to get an own rooted plant. So here you see a plant coming out of a situation like that. This happens to be Chardonnay. Here's a big Chardonnay root, because here's the grafting is down here. This is a plant that was pulled out after the end of the second year. The rootstock's still there, but it really hasn't grown too much. This plant is really being supported by its own, this Chardonnay is being supported by its own roots. So again, you spend a lot of money for rootstock. Uh, there's a pers purpose of that, to, to have that there for the, the, the resistance to whatever pest you're concerned about. So again, make sure that the plants are properly placed. And so oftentimes, the soil's flat and the goal was to throw up a little bit of a berm, whether that's for your weed operation or whatever, you have to anticipate that. And if that's your goal is to throw up a little bit of a berm, you have to put the plants a little higher to accommodate for that. So that graft union is always above wherever that sur soil surface is going to be. The other thing is make sure when you get plants that they're properly disbudded. And so again, here's a good example of what you don't want is a lot of rootstock suckers coming out of the ground. Again, uh, that creates another hand operation to go in and expose those and cut them out properly. And again, you'd rather not do that. And so again, years ago these were taken off by hand or by a brush, but 
currently, now a lot of that's done by a machine. And so, again, that machine sometimes doesn't do 100% of the job. And again, you need to really inspect your plans to make sure you avoid some of these kind of issues that down the road will cause some problems. Now, these are the problems that are, are, are probably the most critical. And so there's two of them here. Here's the potted effect of a potted plant being in that pot too long. That root system had curled, not, had not been teased or anything. And so again, you get these severe uh, restrictions of this root system. Uh, here, it would be the opposite effect. The, the plants were probably fine, but again, the planting was, the planting was wrong. So you, you got what we call J-rooting of this root system. And again, these cause problems down the road. So here, you, again, you see a severe J-rooted plant, and you see this Horizontal growth when that root system should be going down. Uh, here again, not so much J-rooted, but I call them flat-rooted. So maybe the hole wasn't big enough and the plant was just dropped and the root system just kind of lays on the bottom of that hole. Again, they, they, amazingly enough, even those that are not severely J-rooted, it has an effect on the root distribution of that plant uh, for, for, uh, for essentially the life of that, that vine. Here's one I ran to, ran into a number of years, and it was interesting because this vineyard at the time I came out was already 15 years old. It was a very nice looking vineyard, very uniform. It was a great site. It was a, a wonderful vineyard. And then they started noticing plants getting weaker, and, and not really collapsing, but just getting weaker. And so I, I was called out. We finally uh, dug a, a back hole. And if you look at this, from here to here is about five feet. Here's the soil surface here, and all the roots are in the top about 8 to 10 inches. Which, and it's like a, 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 if you look down the row or dug down the row, it's just like a solid mat of very fine roots. And if you dug these plants out, I've never seen something so J-rooted uh, in, in all the years I've looked at vineyards. Uh, they really had to just shove these plants in. And I, what they did is, is uh, use a spade planting spade where they made a slot and they just shoved the plants in. So again, very severely uh, J-rooted, uh, very shallow rooting. What's amazing, this vineyard actually did quite, a well, quite well for 15 years. This vineyard is actually still in there. They still lose plants at a, at a, at a, at a pretty constant rate. Um, but again, the loss of those plants, are you know, they're getting less production. Uh, because it's such a nice site, uh, amazingly enough, they've never run into any fungal issues in this vineyard, very well-drained soil. Uh, but uh, again, this severe uh, kinking up of this root system, again, has an effect on how that root distribution is in that vineyard. And again, on a, on a weaker site or maybe a heavier soil site, you probably would have had a, a much rap more rapid decline of this planting. So again, that is another effect of this jade rooting is this mass of very fine roots that are very sh uh, uh, shallow. And so it's something that we've seen a lot uh, following jade rooting. This was another example of, uh, I was called out and said, they were kind of puzzled. They had plants, and this is again a Pinot Noir vineyard, uh, probably at a time also about 10 to 15 years old. And you see a little bit of a pinking. Not so much, there's no decline. This actually, if anything, some of these plants had a little more growth, but they had a little bit of a pink look in the springtime versus the, the typical look of a, of a Pinot Noir. And if you look at them a little closely, not only were they pink, they were devoid of any clusters. And so that was the main concern is how come these plants don't have any, they look like they're growing fine. They have absolutely no clusters on them. And again, uh, digging up these plants, Severely J-rooted, every one that was pink, J-rooted, and again, this same, this heavy mat. So again, those are the kind of things, and again, this was another very nice site, uh, nice drained loam soil. Uh, so the plants were living, but uh, they were either loss of production, and over time, some of these plants also would get a little weaker, uh, but never really collapsed. And so this is kind of my final example of a bad planting uh, another vineyard, uh, very productive, uh, really a high production vineyard. 
this is on a quad system where they've had a history of very high production in this vineyard. But one year we had, was, this actually was in 2010, we had that heat wave. And after that heat wave, they have these little yellow spots within, within this vineyard. You go to those yellow spots, they had a lot of vines that actually had collapsed from that heat wave. Uh, when you dug up those plants, again, these were potted plants that went in the field, and not the whole field was planted this way. They ran out of plants, and the nursery said, well, we don't have any more dormants, but we've got potted plants. And so they filled in some of the misses and a certain sections of the vineyard with these potted plants. And so, again, because within that tube or, or planting sleeve, they were severely curled around. They actually, uh, these plants actually curl around here, and Andy had another good example, but they actually girdle the base of that rootstock as time goes on. So again, you really have to look at when you use potted plants, what is the root distribution within that plant? Especially the longer they sit in that plant, sometimes you know the nurseries will sell potted dormants. Those are the ones you really have to look at because they've spent uh, the whole year and sometimes beyond that within that pot. And so they ha there's, there's a greater chance the longer they're in that pot and how it also depends on the design of the pot, too. Uh, but I've seen quite a few vineyards that down the road they've run into some issues with that root curling. So again, typically the nurseries have dealt with this by either using longer pots or pots where the roots will actually grow through uh, that pot. Uh, but again, here you see one that looks pretty good. And you know, years ago, I don't know now, I haven't looked at one recently, but Years ago, the contract from the nursery said, if you break that ball up, it's on you if the plants don't live. And so I don't know if they still put that in there. But uh, when there is severe J-rooting, there probably should be some cutting or at least teasing out of that root system prior to planting. So here, this is the same plant. I just moved it up and down a little bit. And so you can see there's, there's a lot of compaction of those roots within those, those sleeves. So what, what, I mean, I showed you a couple of vineyards where it actually, they had severe problems due to that planting, but really no disease problems. The worst thing happens is when you get that J-rooting and, and you initiate some of these root diseases. And so the things we've seen are things like blackfoot caused by cylindra carpin. Uh, this is, uh, again, a fungus that resides in these plants. There's something that initiates, usually some type of stress initiates that fungus to start developing these cankers. Once that happens, even though that risk could be, or that stress could be taken off, oftentimes these plants will, will fail. Sometimes it takes years. So this was a vineyard uh, where everything was, was done right. The problem was it was on a hillside, and we had a, a late spring rain with a, a very heavy rains where the, the, the moisture came down and, and uh, the, the soil at the base was, was saturated. This initiated some blackfoot to start at the root system. You can see the root system, the initial root system was pretty much rotted out here, but that canker started growing and, and just went up. The plant responded by growing new roots, and so these plants actually had very nice root systems, new root systems, but this canker kept on growing, and so eventually it grew up and it would, it would essentially girdle that root system from that plant. And so this was a beautiful vineyard, everything looked great, and all of a sudden they started losing plants. And especially in these wet areas, every year, it started in, in the second year uh, and just continued on. They finally just pulled out the whole planting. Uh, again, so sometimes it's how you plant them, but sometimes it's a site itself, and especially sites that have excessive moisture, uh, especially post-bud break. You could, that can be sometimes initiation of these endophytal, endophytic fun, fungi to develop these cankers and cause problems. The other one we've seen, again, is uh, some of the organisms that cause either vine decline or petri disease. These are the same organisms that later in life cause things like esca or measles. So this is a, an example here. This was a phao acrimonium infection. But again, these plants were young, young in a young vineyard and were, again, severely J-rooted. So again, a lot of the sites that I've looked at, when they have these fungal issues, it's usually Cylindrocarpin is very common. Phaeoacrimonium is also relatively common. And so sometimes we know there's the, that some of these things can be in the soil, especially cylindrocarpin grows on a lot of other, other uh, crops. And so they can be in the soil.
I think oftentimes they come in with the plants. And so then it depends, is, is some uh, stress or some type of issue pop up early in the life of the vineyard, you can have these. And when it happens, that could be uh, uh, very problematic. And, and sometimes it can be quite frustrating because it's not the whole planting, it's a section of the planting. Or sometimes that dieback will, will happen over many years. So again, of the vineyards I've looked at over the years, oftentimes the most common thing is probably improper planting. But I've also seen this where we have poor drainage. Sometimes that poor drainage has been compounded by uh, soil compaction. And in some of the coastal areas on the central coast where we've seen vineyards go behind vegetable production, it's very common in vegetable production, you pick a lettuce or a broccoli crop, uh, the next day they're in there disking, subsoiling, that crops in in a, in a course of, uh, as soon as that, the, that, that prep work is done, and they're working those soils very wet. They really compact them down about 18 inches. And so if you come in and put in a vineyard behind that and haven't broken up that compaction layer, I've seen a couple sites where that's really the source of the problem was that 18 inch layer, that's right where the roots are kind of just above that. You get the, uh, 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 a backup of water if you're over irrigating and you rot out those root systems. So again, uh, irrigation management or nutrition are important. I've also seen a site many years ago where it was the weakest plant. So it was a, a, a sand streak in the vineyard and they weren't watering enough. And those are the plants that were stressed. They came down with some of these vine decline type issues. And again, we know that heavy crop loads, again, too much crop on young plants puts a stress on that plant. They have that, that wood does not develop the kind of carbohydrate storage it needs to kind of survive. And again, sometimes we've seen issues with heavy crop production uh, and then the development of some of these uh, vine decline issues. So to me, this was a, a big enough issue that a number of years ago we, we put in this trial. And, and part of it was also the people were doing this on, on sandier soils or loamy soils. They use a planting spade. And you kind of rock it back and forth. You can put that plant in. And if you, it's all right if you lift it up a little bit. It'll spread that root system out. And we've seen a lot of vineyards go in that way. You can plant really fast. Uh, but there's a lot of things that go wrong with that. And so I've showed you some examples of, of that J-rooting. Some of that was uh, those severe J-rooting was behind what we call this kind of spade type planting. So I had a trial here where we looked at the, the bench graft itself where we untrimmed, so typically you can get them untrimmed or the nurseries oftentimes will deliver them and they have maybe four to six inches of roots, they trim them at the nursery. So we took the, the, these and we trimmed them a little shorter. In our case, we took them about one and a half inches of length. And then we, we also looked at a hole where we dug a hole versus this spade planting. And so again, here's how we handled this. We just trimmed these roots down with the hope that that would reduce would be a potential then if you want to, especially spade plant, that you would have a lesser chance of j-rooting that root system. Again, kind of digging a hole, or here's the spade planting. So you plunge that spade in there, you kind of rock it back and forth, and you put a plant in there. So you can just imagine, if it's not done right, a lot of things go wrong. If the soil's too wet, you really compact the sides of that slot. And then if you don't lift that plant up to spread out that root system, you've, you've j-rooted that plant. And so just because you dig a hole, you could also j-root a plant. And so here's a hole that you put it in a hole, you lift it up, you put soil back in with the hope that you keep that root, those roots distributed down that hole and pointed in a downward direction. But if you just don't dig it deep enough, which is pretty common, you know, most people don't like digging holes that much, but so here is the hole's not deep enough. It was just thrown on the bottom. Uh, it's kind of flat and there's a little bit of cur curving up the side. If you're not there to catch that, they put soil back in there. You've got an issue down the road that might develop. So here's this spade planting. You know, when they're planted, they all look the same, but here you see a case that uh, it, this plant wasn't lifted up. You can see that root is curled up. Again, that, you have some potential issues that may occur down the road from that type of planting. So again, by trimming those roots, where the hope was that 
you could avoid some of the, these, these issues. So we ran this trial uh, for a number of years. And again, so we, we saw that both planting technique and root length can both influence vine growth. Of those two factors, uh, both of them in the first year uh, had an effect on growth. So whether you spade planted or you trim the roots, we saw a little bit less development of that plant in the first year. But of those two factors, really, uh, the, 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 of the two, the, 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 uh, of the two factors tested, reducing root length reduced growth in both the first and the second year. So again, by reducing those roots or cutting off those roots, there's a lot of resources in the plant that helps that plant grow. By trimming those roots, you do to get a little less growth. Then you have to ask yourself, is that risk of maybe not jaring that plant greater than, uh, than, than, than keeping those roots on that plant? But again, uh, in, the, in the third and the fourth year, we didn't see any uh, reduction in yield. So these plants weren't cropped, weren't cropped until the third year. There was no reduction in the plants yield-wise uh, in the third or fourth year from trimming those roots. So again, if you're going to do machine planting, or if you're going to do uh, some of these techniques where, especially the spade type planting, or maybe just any kind of planting, uh, that is one way, I think it's a, it's a logical way of, of handling that, uh, of reducing that risk of J-rooting. So let's talk a little bit now about planting and training. So time of planting. So the type of material you're going to get kind of dictates when you're going to plant. Ideally, you'd like to plant in the springtime as soon as the frost risk is over, if you have a frost risk. So you have dormant materials. If you're ready to go and plant those early, you're going to have a longer season to grow that plant. One of the problems with the, the green plants is they're not, usually not delivered till uh, late spring. We used to get them in May. Now we seem like we get them in July. Sometimes we don't get them until much later. And, and some people I see are planting these things in the fall. So you have to question yourself, what am I getting by putting a plant in the fall or late summer versus if I can get that material in the, in, in the, in the springtime? Uh, I mean, sometimes people aren't ready to plant. or We have a lot of this very rapid pull out a vineyard, put it in the next year. And so sometimes it's hard to get all that redevelopment and infrastructure in to put in the new plants. But again, you have to ask yourself, what are you getting? And so sometimes, especially in certain sites, you have a plant in the ground, but it really is not growing. It really hasn't established itself to the point where it's actually going to make that plant grow better the following year. And so you kind of ask, ask yourself, what are your goals? And so the other thing, of course, what, what kind of training are you going to do? Are you going to actively do green training and try to promote that early development of the plant? Do you have enough vigor to do that? especially if you're going to try to do some first-year training, uh, or are you just going to put the plants in, maybe do some very minimal training, and do a lot of your decisions of tr training that plant in the wintertime, so doing dormant-type dormant uh, training, and just select whatever wood you have there to decide how much you're going to leave on there to, 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 to you know, form that initial uh, uh, vine framework. And so again, we, we have vineyards, especially where you've got moderate to good vigor. We, we see a benefit in doing first year training, so planting that plant, especially with dormant materials, planting that plant, doing some first year training to at least partially develop that plant. And I'll show you a little bit of at least what my, some of my work has shown, as opposed to doing kind of, we call the traditional thing where we put a vine in, let it kind of grow for a year, cut it back, and then do the start the training in the second year of that vineyard's life. So I've done a whole series of looking at greens versus dormants, uh, tubes, no tubes, all the different variations. And so that's why this says trial three. This is like the third in the succession of all these. But we had a trial of one year or, or a number of years that we uh, looked at a number of different factors. So we looked at the use of a paper carton versus a plastic grow tube. Uh, and then we looked at uh, leaving all the shoots the first year or actively training those plants. So train, uh, thinning them down to a single shoot, putting on one of these type of shelters, and then letting that plant grow. Uh, 
And then in the second year of that vineyard's development, we either left a trunk or we cut it back to a spur. So all these combinations were, uh, were, were evaluated. And so go, as far as the use of a growth tube versus either no growth tube or a, 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 a little short paper uh, sleeve, we typically would see better development of that shoot, where you leave one or all, in that growth tube versus uh, the, uh, the, the, the paper shelter. Now a lot of that is you get really long internodes. That shoot grows really fast because it wants to get the hell out of that tube and get in the sun. So you get a rap more rapid shoot development. Sometimes that wood's a little thin. Uh, and then once it gets out of that tube, it grows the same as, 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 uh, as the one that's not in that plastic grow tube. Again, if you cut those plants back, so if you get some additional growth, but you don't keep that additional growth in the first year, you lose that effect. So then oftentimes those two plants will grow very similar in the second year. So again, our, our bottom line is when growth's adequate, first year training could give you at least the start of the development of a trunk or a complete trunk. That then gives you a little bit of jump start to develop cordons or, or heads if you're cane pruning. And again, we've seen a lot of benefit in, in getting earlier vine development, bigger vines earlier, and also more potential for production. I think this slide shows it quite well. So here you see uh, a vineyard planted at the same time. These were, this is the second year after planting. These were planted in 2011. This vine here uh, was uh, left as a trunk after the end of the first year. These vines were cut back to a two-bud spur. And so you, you look at the growth here, you look at the growth here. These vines uh, in the second year, where these trunks were thinned and four to five shoots were left to grow on the top to form the head, this is going to be cane pruned. These were uh, topped, so the lateral, the top laterals were allowed to grow. And so here you see how much growth you have here versus You've got a few shoots coming out here. But again, you see a much earlier point in that vineyard's life in this season. You've got a lot more canopy. You're getting a lot more development of that plant. These will end up being larger plants than these, larger trunks, better shoots, and the higher potential for production earlier in the life of that vineyard. So, I would when well, we don't dig them up because I, I do all my work in growers' fields. They don't get they don't like you digging up their plants. But <laughs> typically, if you're seeing better growth, I would sur surmise that you're getting better development of the roots also. So these, I mean, oftentimes uh, you, you have to make the choice. The, the the thing you have to remember is don't overcrop these. So these have four to five shoots. Each of those shoots has probably one to, to two clusters. So you've got some crop here, very minimal crop here, because uh, these, these actually, you could, if you wanted to, you could crop them, or you can see the nice canes you have there. You've got really nice canes for developing a head uh, in, after the second year, as opposed to here where you have much smaller wood. Well, it's doing both. Because you've got much earlier development here, and this could also be a cordon where you thin them out. At the end of the year, whether you have a head and you're developing a cane system or whether you are developing cordons, that much larger canopy, you get larger canopies because even on a cane system you get much better lateral shoot development when you do that versus something that you're training up. Uh, that additional, that bigger canopy is going to give you more resources to build up that vine. And so we've looked at these a number of times. We always get bigger vines by leaving, at least especially leaving a trunk. The problem is when you start leaving cordons really early that you've got to really be careful that you're, you don't overcrop them. But if you don't overcrop them, you, if you keep a, a crop on there that's balanced with what kind of camp you have, we've never seen any negative effects. So I've only got five minutes, so I've got to zip through this. But I'll, I'll show you, uh, this will show that effect fairly well. So here's where we, we the used a, uh, one of these tall vines. This happened to be a uber vine, a dormant plotted bench graft. So these are high. They're 36 inch plants versus the standard. These were all potted plants, potted dormants. Uh, 
So these were planted at the same time. Uh, we looked at this effect. Okay, you get much better development. How much do you want to crop these? And so what we had, we took all the crop off. Well, it's, well I call it full crop, but we shoot thinned them to, to establish the, uh, the, the spur positions we wanted. And then we left all the whatever clusters there we left. And then another set of vines, whatever clusters were there, we cut off half. So we've got different crop levels. We compared that here to a, to a, a standard that we developed as a trunk in the second, after the first year, or we cut it back to a two-bud spur. So here you see, uh, so this is an example of one of these tall plants. So here, this is all rootstock. Here's the graft union. Here's the little spur. So this, we planted these in 2011. So here you see an example of the development you have on this uh, tall plant uh, a couple months after planting. Here's the, the standard plants. So again, we're developing cordons here. We're just growing a, a shoot on the other side here. So that, this is an example of what these plants look like at the end of the second year. So here you see the cordons are developed about three-quarter length. Here's our standard uh, traditional trading uh, that we cut down to a spur. And here's where we left a, a trunk. So here's what these vines look like in the end of the second year. So here's the tall vine. Look at that trunk. Look at that cordon. Uh, look at that those shoots on that canopy. Much better development than the trunk treatment or the spur treatment. So this is the largest vine. This is next with the spur. You see again we've got bigger cordons than the traditional system just by leaving that trunk the first year. Amazingly enough you can leave some pretty small uh, trunks there and then, as long as you don't crop it uh, those trunks size up and they'll, they'll always be bigger in my, all, the, all the trials I've done these comparisons, that's always bigger than uh, the traditional method. It gives you a bigger trunk, bigger vine, and earlier development in that canopy, uh, or the potential for growing a canopy in that vine. So here at the end of this, this is the, uh, in 2015, so here again you see, uh, this is the tall vine, the trunk treatment, and the uh, standard. You can still, once you, once you get those, uh, whether they're larger trunks or larger um, cordons, those other vines never really catch up because they, they, they get bigger every year, but that other one's always a little bit bigger. They all have the same canopies. At the end, they all have the same canopy. The shoots were the same, but the, the, the permanent structure on this one was always bigger. I have to say these were the, the best uh, tall vines or uber vines that I've ever seen. They were dormant. They were beautiful plants. They grew phenomenally well. And so here was the yield response we saw on those. So, and uh, so here is uh, obviously the, the traditional gave us no crop in the second year. Uh, we got a little bit of crop with the trunk treatment. So essentially you're developing some uh, shoots to develop the cordon. So you've got uh, some clusters there. We, we chose to leave those on there. And here's where we had the, the cordon develop. We had got, uh, I can't even see that, it's 2.8 tons on a per acre basis just by the use of those uber vines and doing early treatment. That, that uh, and so here you see these colors, these are the, some of these, is, uh, this one here is the, uh, so here's the zero crop, obviously I had zero crop here. So what did that crop, having that 2.8 tons on this, uh, this is happening to be a Chardonnay vineyard, have a negative effect on the third or fourth year? So here you see, uh, where you had crop or no crop, again, those vines looked the same, had the same pruning weights, had the same trunk diameters. There was no negative impact of having that crop. So that additional, or the potential for crop development was based on getting good quality material and doing actively training these vines to promote the, 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 the development of that vine and the capacity of that vine to produce crop. So here you see in the second year, the, the standard traditional method, less crop, Here's the, uh, where you left a trunk, a little bit more trunk, potential trunk or crop. And then in the, uh, in, the, in the fourth year or the third year of production, uh, these are really all, we're not, statistically, we're not the same. But here you see, again, if you look at these plants at this point, the, the traditional is the smallest plant. Yes. Yes. 
zero crop and full crop. So that's just a demonstration of having that crop had no negative effect on these plants. Now you also remember that they have to be balanced. And so you could put a lot of crop on a plant. If you don't have the growth and the canopies to support it, you'll, you will see a negative effect. And so again, uh, you look at these fruit, and this happened to be in, in the fourth year, if you look at these fruit to perennial ratios, there, you've got a lot of canopy there to support that crop. And so we, when you're in that situation, if you're around four or five, you're not going to see any negative effect. I have pushed these trials, uh, trials like this before, not so much with these tall plants, but just with standard plants where you're getting above that optimal range and getting up in nine and ten. Oftentimes, then you will see a negative effect on the growth of those plants in, in, the, in the next season. But if, if, if you're in this kind of range, it's not a problem. Yes? So those tall plants come, and they're essentially a preformed trunk. So in the first year, if you get them as dormant plants, you can essentially form a cordon pretty easily. You buy them, that, yeah, they come that way. So the nurseries will develop you know, or sell these type of materials. The question you have, you have to ask yourself, are you getting the quality materials? I don't, I ran out of time now, but I, I, I've done another trial or s several other trials similar to this. If you don't get the quality material, I, I did a, a backup to this one where we looked at uh, green versus uh, dormant uh, tall vines, and again, if the plant material is not of quality, you don't get, you still get some growth response, you get a big, bigger vine or earlier, but you don't always get that, this kind of crop response. And so again, the, the point being, the quality of the material you get from a nursery has a big uh, part of what kind of growth response you get in the field. So you have to kind of gauge especially if you're going to start cropping these or, or developing them early, do I have the kind of vigor that will support what, what your kind of goals are? But you do have the potential sometimes to get these vineyards up and trained out. The, the decision you have to make is how fast am I going to crop these? And so when you're in a situation where you don't have the canopy, you've got to thin them down. If you don't want to thin them down, then you need to prune them more severely early on to avoid an overcropping situation. And so I've looked at those. I've looked at the trimming on some of these tall field plants. Again, we see the same thing. The more we trim them, we get a little bit of less growth in that first year. But generally, in the second and third year, we don't see a negative effect. And so again, you have to ask yourself, what are the issues you're trying to avoid? Are you trying to avoid J root issues? I don't think. I think trimming is a good management decision. Um, if, if you don't think, uh, however, you're, the way you're planting those are, are, are going to have uh, maybe some potential for J. Rooney. Uh, and then this rate of development is, is again, it's, it, you have to kind of gauge the kind of growth you're going to get. But again, for, especially for high vigor sites, if you do some additional training, um, the problem with high vigor sites, the more you delay that, Training, you're, you're putting a lot of energy into to one shoot sometimes. And so if you do early training, sometimes you can get a little smaller wood. And you can use crop as a management tool to hold those, those, those uh, vines back a little bit. So with that, I'll stop. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yep. Yeah, you know, I don't. I didn't have these tall vines years ago. I did a, a, the rootstock and then grafted them. Compared that to a dormant bench graft versus, versus a green growing bench graft, and actually the, the 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 rootstock rootings that were grafted gave the best growth in 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 the second year. And it was interesting. They but they grew so well that the wood was so vigorous they were actually less fruitful. So we didn't we cropped those in the third year. They actually had a lower crop than the weaker. Uh, the dormant bench grafts, because the wood was so v vigorous that it reduced the fruitfulness. And so you get in those effects too, but it did produce the, the largest plants. So then in the fourth year, they actually had really nice crops. 
they actually had a little more, well, they, all of them have more than the greens. The greens, especially in these cooler coastal areas, give you the smallest plants. It delays the production a little bit. So again, jelly, the bigger the wood, or the more vigorous the shoot growth is, the more you can advance that, that development of the vine framework. The, the, the big trick is not to overcrop those. Well, most of these trials, uh, yeah, what do you mean by pruning? Well, we train those. I mean, we cut off enough. Essentially, we're, those were like cordon trained vines, so we're training out that cordon. And so we're active. Where you actively train that, you cut off whatever you're not going to leave on that plant. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think we they irrigated more in that vineyard. So the vineyard was I mean, we do I do these trials in commercial vineyards, and so it was it was irrigated according to the six you know the, the standard plants. And no, we didn't have it. No, yeah. Okay.